Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to my session for Sketchbook Revival. I'm so happy and honored to be back on this amazing summit. It's one of my favorites to join. So, for my session today, we are going to be creating a colorful, expressive watercolor portrait, a colorful watercolor portrait, <laughs> double up on the word color. Um, much like, I'll show you some other examples, much like this kind of portrait, or this kind of portrait, or uh, this kind of portrait. As you can see, they have something in common, and I have already mentioned in the um, intro earlier what we're going to be, how we're going to be creating these portraits, and what the, um, the perhaps the challenges, or it might not feel challenging, it might feel liberating. So the key, not this one, this is something else. So the key to these kinds of portraits is that I'm creating them with a limited palette. So we're using two or three, here a little bit more, this is a slightly different style. We're using just two or three colors to create this vibrant, colorful, expressive portrait. So, um, let me talk about the supplies that you're going to need for these. Uh, so I like to use watercolor paints uh, for mostly, is it? Yes, let me just have a quick look. Yeah, mostly watercolor paint for a portrait like this. Now, we're going to only be working with two or three colors. So if you want to work in exactly the colors I'll be working in, it's going to be um, something along the lines of a couple of oranges, a pink. This is a very special color that I use in these types of portraits a lot. It's called Opera Pink and it's actually by Daniel Smith if you're super specific about the color you, you want to use. However, you don't need to use the, my paints. You can just use any kind of watercolor paints that you have lying around and basically choose two or three colors probably um, in an analogous color scheme. You could also use complementary colors etc but that makes it uh, perhaps a little more challenging. Um, so analogous color schemes, for those who don't know, if you have a color wheel, our analogous color schemes are basically colors that sit closely together on the color wheel. So I will be using a pink, which is a version of red, uh, a darkish orange, and maybe a lightish orange, and that's about it. I may be tempted to bring in one complement. One of my favorite color schemes is called um, analogous complementary, which is one of the lesser known color schemes, by the way. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm not sure yet if I might bring in a bit of a compliment. I can do or I might not, but I, if I do, I'll probably do it quite uh, later in the process so that these colors don't mix as we're painting. Because if you mix complementary colors, they can uh, end up as uh, what people sometimes refer to as mud or neutral tones, which sometimes is great um, to have in your in your mix. And sometimes you're, they might be a bit unexpected and they don't quite do they might not quite fit what you had in mind. Okay, so we're going to be mostly working with watercolor paints as well as some color pencils uh, for a little bit of shading. Uh, these darker, these darker uh, bits there are done with a Stabilo Oil pencil, and um, that's a, a very black water soluble pencil which I love. So I enjoy high contrast stuff, so I bring in black quite a bit. I'll also be working with um, some either well, some paint markers, which will be either Bosca pen or I now I now just use a brand called Artistro. I've only recently discovered these. In black and white would be helpful. And then what else? Yeah, and some pencils really. So for the shading, I use some dark red pencil here and some black. Um, a black Stabilo Oil. In this one we have a little bit, a bit of collage as well, but I think we'll avoid the collage today. This is a different style. Um, let's have a look. No collage there either. This one. These are all in the same, done in a similar style. That one as well. I'm just seeing if there's anything else that I need you to use. I think that's it. Now in color choice wise, color choice wise, as you can see here I used uh, blues and pinks. That's another thing you could do. You can that's um can use sort of slightly more complementary colors, but you just have to work slightly carefully. This works okay because if you mix these two colors it becomes kind of a purple or you know it leans towards a blue violet then and it's not as um it doesn't become a neutral tone. But just be careful with when you um, choosing your colors. I'm going to choose the colors that I've used most in this um, journal. 
Uh, so it's going to be pinks, reds and a light orange or a light yellowy kind of color. Now you don't have to work in an, in an art journal but um, as we're doing sketchbook revival you might want to do this in a journal. <laughs> My journal is... Um, this is... So this journal is a Robertson watercolor sketchbook. Sadly these have been discontinued to my great upset and sadness. Um, but I still have quite a few to fill, so I'm, I'm still working on these. But the best type of paper to work on for this type of portrait is watercolor paper, preferably 140 pounds, a little bit less thin, uh, less thick is also fine, maybe mm, yeah, 120 pounds or, or something is also okay. And then I like working hot pressed, but uh, grainy cold pressed is fine as well. Okay, so we're going to be working, we're going to be creating a front facing portrait. I I've already pre sketched this character. If you are feeling a little, if you are feeling a little intimidated by the drawing process, then I have included a traceable file. Feel free to trace this face if that's uh, more comfortable for you. But I'll also demonstrate just in a moment how I draw a front facing portrait. And then what I like doing personally, this is just kind of my thing, is I like adding botanical and do botanical shapes and doodles and diddle little diddly dits around the character. Um, that's something that I enjoy doing as a, uh, from the perspective of that it's meditative and fun. It also makes the portrait perhaps a little more interesting for my for me personally. I like it when the portrait is kind of almost like evoking some mystery. Like, what does that mean? Why is that doodle there? Why is I don't know? Why are there swallows flying above her head? I don't know. That's just me. You don't have to do that. That's all optional, of course. And um, what else? So yeah, I added all these like little characters. So there's a dragonfly here. There are the swallows there. There's a rose here. And I have, um, these are very sort of typical signature style little elements that tend to reoccur in all of my artwork. But like I say, these are all optional. Doodles can sort of be very personal and meaningful to you and um, they might, I don't know, uh, I, for me they are very personal and so um, they tend to recur in my artwork. That also helps with style development. So it all depends on where you're at in your art journey. Um, if you want to kind of start doing that or not. Now, let's think, what else should we do? So, I think I've done enough of the intro explaining what we need. So let's get started on drawing a front-facing portrait. Okay. Okay, so the way I tend to sketch a front-facing portrait by hand, rather than tracing or any other tools, is by, first of all, starting with a, an oval shape. Depending on how round you want the person's face to be, you can make them more or less oval. And I do, I sketch this lightly. I don't sit down and press hard. I sketch it lightly. And then to give myself a sense of where the facial feature is going to be, I will pull, pull, uh, draw one vertical line through the middle of the oval. And I will draw one horizontal line through the middle of the oval. These are rough, rough guidance. This is where the nose will be in the middle of the mouth and the middle of sort of the space between the eyes. This is where the eye line will roughly be. And then again, these are all rough guidelines. So we're going to half that again and we're going to half that too. And that's roughly where the nose is and roughly where the mouth is. Now, my work is quite stylized and quite mm, non realistic. So I don't really do realism. I do kind of exaggerated features or I minimize features. Um, and so. Um, it really depends on what kind of style you want and what you're looking to achieve in life. But for this kind of work, my work, there's a lot of sort of creative freedom when it comes to uh, where you place your facial features. And you can play with that as well. You can make the eyes larger or smaller, or you can move the mouth and nose up and a bit higher, a bit lower, and see what you like. Okay. So then what I tend to do is I tend to put a flat, again a flat oval, lots of ovals in my <laughs> drawing approach, flat ovals for the eyes and roughly allow, roughly, for the size of one eye space in between the two. That's kind of based on a semi-realistic uh, uh, realistic face. And then for the nose I tend to start with a little circle and then I make, I, I build a super simple, my nose is a fairly simple, I tend to start a little circle and then I make two little sideways dots for nostrils and they can be larger or smaller. And then on the side we do this sort of two halves, like a brackety shapes that become the rest of the outer nostrils. And then sometimes I connect this together and then I make 
Under here comes something called the philtrum. This little shape, you can feel it above your own upper lip. I used to call it the lip dip, but it's called the philtrum apparently. So you have the philtrum, and then about right under the philtrum comes that V-shape that not everyone has, but uh, some kind of shape here that denotes that that middle part, that middle section of of the upper lip. I tend to do a V shape for it, and then you can pull the the sides down for the lips, and then here a little bulge for that inside bulge of the lip, and then I pull that down for the lower lip. And again, you can play with how large you want the mouth to be, how small you want it to be. You can change the, sh the shape of the nut, you can change the shape of the nose or the nostrils, make it smaller, larger, etc. That's up to you entirely. Okay, and then for the eyes, the way I tend to um, start giving form to the eyes is I tend to make quite pronounced tear ducts. Even though I've rarely really seen people with super pronounced tear ducts, but mine are fairly pronounced depends on what I'm drawing or painting. And then I kind of make those the upper lines. I firm up the lines here and again you can change with eye shape, you can make them you know you can pull them up more, you can make them larger, smaller, thinner, rounder, up to you. It's all fine. This is obviously so many beautiful faces in the world that you can play with different shapes and sizes and everything. And this is just how I tend to do them. Now, my eyes, again, are usually quite large for, if you compare it to realistic faces. This is quite large eyes. Um, but, and I sometimes make them smaller in the process of shading. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So anyway, here, then we do the irises. Now the irises in my eyes are rarely fully exposed. They have uh, maybe a quarter or a third are covered up by the upper eyelid here. And same for the pupils. I tend to do quite big pupils. So sometimes I... so f Sorry, let me just show you that again. So I, I, I also like messing around with eyes. So here I'm doing strange things. Uh, sometimes I put a heart for a... Sometimes I make different colored eyes. Sometimes I put a star inside the eye. It's part of my mystery creating... Uh, mystery creating... <laughs> thing. So the pupil, you, know, you see a little heart inside the pupil, or whatever. So I like to play around. Here's a no normal, quote unquote, normal two eyes. But I like to play around with the eyes. Again, you don't have to. It's just for me to know. It adds a bit of mystery to the portrait, which I enjoy. But so if you were to do a straightforward one, I make kind of fairly large pupils. Um, and I, I again have half of it, or not a half actually, for more like a third of it covered. Okay, and then here's this tear ducts, the endy bits. So here we have the, the the structure of the face. I think you know if I were to like work on this, this is a sketch now. But if I was to work on this more, I probably would make the eyes a little smaller. So I, when I do sketching, I'm not someone who minds erasing and trying and erasing and trying. So I'm someone who will faff around. I don't know if faffing is also a term used in in other countries other than the UK. Um, play around, try out, change, you know, take things out, add it back in, do that a lot before I commit to painting. So don't think that you have to kind of draw in one go and be happy with it. Some people think that sometimes. I, I personally feel that. But for me it's very important to have a connection with the face that I'm drawing. Uh, before I want to paint. So for instance right now she looks a little stern. So if I wanted her to be a bit more smiley for instance I might pull up the, the, the corners of the mouth a little so give her a slightly softer facial expression. Maybe I want the eyes to be slightly smaller so I might adjust that a little bit. Maybe I want her to be slightly happier looking for instance. I don't know, yeah? So I can, you can do the same. You can play around with facial features until you're happy. She looks a little friendlier now, you see that? Like I made a small change. And she's already friendlier looking, not as stern. And I feel like these need to be less pronounced. Okay. See, now I'm already loving her face a lot more than I did just now. So I might just make the pupils a little... And then we're going to put some eyebrows in. Now with eyebrows, 
ends with the eyes, by the way. If you want to to make her look, so facial expressions are influenced very much by eyebrows and the upper lines of the eyelid and the eye eye fold, eye crease fold. That's very much in the, the the look the the facial ex the emotional sort of expression is very much influenced by the these three lines here. It's a quick one on the side here, so with eyes, and you can play around with that. If you have two eyes and you make the eye lines, so those three lines that I just talked about, if you make them more that way, she'll, they'll look angrier, sterner, you see? This is an angry person, right? And if you make them more, and of course this is in degrees, so I'm doing it for exaggeration really kind of extreme, so that you see the effect. If you make the, these three lines more this way, they look sadder or more kind of full of compassion kind of thing, caring, you see? But it can also be like this, look, then it's a caring thing almost, like, oh, I look after you and I'm caring, I'm friendly-ish. But the more you do this, the sadder it will look, you know? Okay, so just remember that when you are drawing, particularly the eyes and the eyebrows, they are, it's all in there. A lot of the emotion sits in that area, in combination with the mouth. Okay, but she looks friendly, slightly sad. I'm, I, you know, if, ch let me show you what happens when I do the eyebrows more angrily. She becomes sterner. So we won't do it super pronounced. Let's say we do this. Oh, that's quite pronounced, actually. <laughs> I won't do it super pronounced, and then I do that. <laughs> See, already she looks a little bit more, well, maybe a bit quizzical almost. So I prefer either neutral or slightly more compassionate, saddish looking. I don't really want them to look sad, but I want them to look, um, I don't know, like they're thinking or they can, they're caring. A lot of my characters, for those of you who don't know my work, um, a lot of my characters tend to come across for me as kind witnesses of whatever I am trying to process in that moment. So I use my art process a lot for healing and personal development and growth and so the portraits are either often either myself self-portraits indirectly because they don't look like me or they are kind of these sort of angelical higher beings that are listening to me and are there as a supporting character or witness that's what i've kind of found over the years okay so i'm pretty happy with how this face is <clears throat> and then what i would do is bring the hair and the the neck and the shoulders in and it's usually I will do a neck, maybe I might do it slightly sideways and then bring in some shoulders. We're not going to do clothing and all that sort of stuff. This can be an area for uh, doodles and things and words if you wanted to express yourself with some words as well. And then for hair, yeah, hair is, you have so many cool hairstyles and hair and ways of dealing with hair, but I tend to, for this one, uh, from this one that I've designed for today on the, in my sketchbook, it's a bit like this. We're getting a little thing going like that and then she has sort of a little I don't know like a little not I want to say comb over that's not, <laughs> not what this is called but kind of hair that sits um, folded over should we say that and like I say the hair is often a place for me where I play around with lots of extra things like doodles and stuff so I'm not too worried about it making it you know, super realistic in any way in particular. And then I put a flower here. I like doing impressions of roses. And my impressions of roses, I do super straightforward. You can do whatever you like. Mine are just, they start off with a little squiggle in the middle and then I build the, the extra petals around it, like so. Super easy, straightforward. You know, nothing major. And you can do other kinds of flowers if you have others in mind. You know, you do what makes your your heart happy. Do what you like. So the doodles are usually sort of for me the the, the things that that I that are meaningful to me. So swallows have a specific meaning to me. Butterflies and dragonflies mean something special to me. You might have certain animals that mean something special to you that you could weave into the process. Um, for me, doing that is to know it works as a supporting action uh, for me. It's like a, a me so it's almost soothing for me to do so. So it reminds me of certain specific things. And it's a caring move on my part. So and then the hair here, but this is just, you know, it's so personal. So you just bring in what personally speaks to you. Um, 
yeah, okay. And then I had some hair fall down as well here, for some reason, so like that. Look how lovely. Oh, I like her. Um, and then I did, I liked it, but I, I have put a dragonfly half on her face and half off her face. But I will probably erase that first before because I, I, while I'm painting, I'd like that to not be there and bring it in, bring it, bring it back later. But basically, I have a dragonfly there. Dragonflies are, uh, if you want to do dragonfly as well, I do them super easily again. There's a little head, and then it has another little sort of. Is that the thorax? I don't know what which part of the dragonfly is called what, and then it has a long kind of tail. And then their wings are uh, usually quite, t you, they've got two on either side and they're quite thin and long like so. And then you can quirkify them by doing swirly little tentacles. Quite nice there. I could add another one to a dragonfly. And then I, I like to add my kind of quirky um, stars on a stick, star flowers and heart flowers and moon flowers. I do these, um, these are kind of doodles that I, that tend to occur in most of my work. But that's kind of all optional and you can have your own. Here, instead of doing a butterfly wing, which I normally do, I was adding kind of some botanicals. So while we paint later on, I'll show you that I also um, playfully add some kind of botanical shapes that are not very, again, realistic. They're much more just expressive rather than, oh, we're painstakingly going to do a, a beautiful flower here or something. I just do these kind of impressions of twigs and leaves and sometimes you're not sure if it's a leaf or not. That's kind of fine. And then I had more roses here as well, but it's so optional if you wanted to add more natural elements or not. Um, and then what I also like to do at the final, final step often is adding some words and quotes to my artwork. So in jour journals for me, art journaling for me, because we're doing sketchbook revival. Um, my art journaling, we call it art journaling in my mixed media community, um, often, not always. Uh, it's less about sketching for, as let's say, as a, either a recording a daily life or um, uh, as a sketch like for some other other art artworks like an inspiration or a study. Often art journalists in the mixed media art community do so for again personal processing, sometimes record keeping, daily record keeping, but also just feeling keeping, right? And expressing themselves and working on their own emotions and, and having that expressed. So I often end up um, end my my artwork or while I'm working with meaningful quotes or words or just little little writing where I'm getting in touch with my feelings and emotions and put that into the the, the, the process of, of my creating of the, the art journal spread, which can be really cathartic. And it's just sort of a listening to oneself and a self-connection, kind of empathic witnessing, which can be very healing and very, um, uh, yeah, I was going to say really develops me personally and is great for personal growth. Okay, so here's the sketch. Here's how I would go about drawing a face like that. And now it's the time for the, the painting start part. So as this is a summit, we will uh, time-lapse the painting part, but I will do a voice over uh, the painting part as well, so you know what I'm using and what my thought process is, and, um, and let you know if I'm using any different materials that I haven't mentioned yet. Okay, so let's get started on this. I hope you're enjoying this session and that you enjoy the whole thing. If you do, please consider following me uh, on social media. I'm mostly on at Willowing in most of the places. I'm on Instagram, that's one of my favorite f places. Also on Facebook and um, on YouTube as well. So I'd love to see you there. And please tag me in the Facebook group if you post anything in response to my session. I'd love to see what you do. It's always a great honor to be able to facilitate uh, people making artwork and it's a great inspiration to me to see what you do in response to my sessions. Thank you so much for having me and uh, yeah, let's get started on the painting process. Okay, so we're going to start off with two colors. I use pink and orange as my, these are analogous colors, so they sit closely together in the color wheel. And basically these are pretty much the two main colors I use. And what I do with these kinds of portraits, I um, follow a shading pattern that I've come to call like high contrast portraits. So I leave large segments of the face white and I add the paint in areas where I know there would be shading. 
So there's going to be shading around the eyes, the nose, and uh, some of the sort of in the in the ed on the, around the edges of the face as well. So I'm just simply starting off with some first layers. And what you need to know about watercolor is that it tends to fade in color as it dries. So initially you might add a layer and think, "Wow, that looks really vibrant," and then it it fades when you're when you're done. So additional layers are needed if you want to keep that vibrancy. So here I'm actually already adding some splatter, so I'm doing this playfully. I'm not kind of too worried about um, perfection here. Um, that's generally a good approach to take in life. <laughs> uh, and so I added some splatters and I added in a second layer already. And I'm, I'm kind of alternating between the pinks and the oranges when it comes to adding the layers. So you see there I'm kind of already doing some doodles as well. So this is an expressive watercolor portrait where, again, realism and staying too realistically or trying to achieve a realistic uh, portrait isn't really the aim. The aim is kind of playfulness, uh, expressiveness. So I added these little scallopy things in the neck and I added some some kind of marks at the in the, her hair, some splatters there while I paint. And you can kind of just do this intuitively, follow what you like doing. Okay, so you could see that perhaps that you can see here that the um, the layers have dried and again it's faded. So I'm adding yet another layer and I'm continuing to still work with, actually uh, I say that, but this is actually here a magenta. I can see that that is not quite the same pink I'm using. So I'm using variations of the same color. So I started off with that bright pink. Oh, here I'm doing some drips. Uh, bright pink and then I'm also using some uh, magenta in there as well. And here I'm starting to add some color to the eyes. I'm sticking with the same color scheme still, so we're adding, we're creating pink eyes, and I like it like that. <laughs> you see, so we're just limiting ourselves to that, uh, to the kind of one palette, and you'll see that it works. It's not a problematic thing in the end. Okay, so hair, I'm starting to add some strands of hair to the hair area and again I'm doing this loosely while at the same time adding some marks outside of the the portrait. And here I'm adding some line work to the botanicals already. So you'll see me working back and forth between the face and then mark making and the botanicals. Um, I don't necessarily first finish the entire page uh, face and then do the botanicals for instance. Right here I'm using a, a Posca pen or a, a, a paint marker, it's actually a different brand, by Artistro, to start bringing in some line work around the eyes and the face and the nose, the, the facial features, just to kind of refine and define some of these facial features again. I don't always do this, um, um, but I love doing it on these kinds of pages, as it helps refine the shape of the, the portrait that I'm doing. What I love about working with paint markers as well is they're great for creating doodles and extra little details or adding words. So here I'm kind of doing that uh, fun thing with the eye that I like. So I'm <laughs> and I'm uh, yeah creating just more detail inside the eyes, adding some little line work uh, where I feel it's needed. Oh, and I may have, I'm not sure if I mentioned that we might be using some pencils as well. They're coming up soon, I think. All right, eyebrows as well. I'm, I'm using my lines for this kind of work are usually a little bit scribbly or sketchy. I try not to do really thick, unbroken lines. Okay. So then you saw me just add some kind of doodles to the, to the face already. As I mentioned before, I really like the mystery of kind of adding odd kind of little doodles or shapes to faces. Oh yeah, sorry, I don't know if I mentioned that I'll be using, we'll be using some color pencils as well. So with color pencils I like to deepen the shading around the eyes. I'm using a reddish uh, magenta here to create that darker, these darker areas. And in the mouth, uh, usually the upper lip is darker than the lower lip. So um, I added some pencil to the mouth there as well. And basically I'm applying this pencil in the areas where I would expect the shading to be. Okay, now here back to a bit more paint, so I'm bringing back in a bit more paint. A bit of the orange, but we're still sticking with the two analogous colors, orange and pinks. Ok, 
keeping some areas white. And oh yeah, I keep drying between each layer, as you can see. I use a hairdryer for that. And here I'm applying more doodles. The, um, the Lotus, I just did first with some pencil, just to make sure that I got the shape right. If I hadn't, that would have erased. And here we go, I love the, the, the Lotus shape. Lotus shape is beautiful. And more doodles and doodles and doodles. <laughs> it's just something I really love doing. And again, it's an optional step, but makes um, my portraits, I feel like, really mysterious. Okay, a bit more shaping of the mouth there with some pencil pe uh, pen. Uh, and here we go. Now, this is actually a color that I haven't used before. It's a bit of a dark purple. And I'm using it to cast some shading under the eyes there, as well as the red that came back. Okay, this here is a Stabilo All Pencil. And this is a very, very water-soluble pencil. It's very responsive to water. So be careful using these pencils as you get an inky puddle of black ink if you add water to it, which can be really helpful sometimes and at other times it's unexpected and uh, you wish you hadn't used the pencil. <laughs> but uh, it's one of my favorite tools to use. just need to know how to use it and that it will be very inky. Okay, so here I'm adding some botanicals to, to the uh, neck area. And here you can see how I activated that to be the all pencil on how black and inky it is straight away. And I'm, I'm, using, I'm using it to leave some marks there again. So I'm constantly sort of working between adding color blocks and then adding marks, adding some shading, maybe adding some marks. Um, and it's a really playful way of creating a portrait because again, you're not too worried about perfection or realism, you're just messing around a bit, splattering, you know, playing with paint, playing with marks and tools, and just uh, express yourself, you know, express what's there for you, what shape calls you, is there a particular mark that you, that's just saying, I want to be expressed right now, and you can add that either to the left of your journal or in the face, that's the beauty about journals, is that it's such a safe place to explore in and just play around in like here you see here all these little marks there like little stamps with brushes little shapes added it's just fun and expressive and actually quite meditative one of the things that i love about creating art is that it can be really meditative and um therapeutic by because it's often repetitive and it's mark making um hypnotic mark making <laughs> for me. <laughs> okay, so here I'm adding, I've just added some line work to those flowers, to the rose, the big rose that's standing out, and a bit of the hair again. I'm using some white acrylics here because I wanted to lighten that part of the face up, apparently. And now I'm looking back, I'm like, oh, I don't know why that's needed. But in that moment, that's what I wanted. <laughs> I'm surprising myself because I'm editing this a bit l later than I when I had recorded it, so that's interesting. So I forgot what I've done. Okay, and I'm lightening up some of the neck area as well. Um, there's probably was some sometimes some kind of um, some areas would be bothering me, and that's why that's happening. That's interesting to see. Okay, then I'm using a white Posca pen. This is a white acrylics marker. I'm adding these little highlights to the eyes, and that really make them pop. I also added that little little couple of highlights on the nose, and these kind of details can really help um, shape a face and kind of create really lovely effects there. Then with my white Posca pen I also tend to add doodles to the face. Oh, and here I'm bringing in that but uh, not butterfly, dragonfly that we talked about before. I'm wondering how I'm going to deal with the fact that that wing is going to be... I'm probably going to do a, th a tiny wing because, yeah, otherwise it's going over the eye. See, I'm tr practicing, trying that out with the with the pencil because I'm worried about the wing covering more, too much of the eye. So I bet you I'm going to do some smaller wings there. Yes. Okay. Ha ha ha! I know myself so well. <laughs> okay. So here we got the beautiful dragonfly added to the face, and some little antenna there. Very nice. All right. Let it dry again. 
Okay, here I'm using that Bosca pen again. No, not Bosca pen, sorry. Um, Stabilo All Pencil, just to add some expressive marks and hair strands. And it can be just so create such a good feeling just to play around, not worrying about what kind of marks you're making and just be a bit scribbly with it all. It can be really, really fun and feel really good. And bringing in that black really helps with contrast. As you may see, if you squint your eyes now, you'll see that the black really helps with that, that um, value contrast. Now, I have a tendency to do quite high contrast uh, work anyway. But if you're ever struggling with that, you can have a look at this portrait and see. If you squint your eyes, you can see more easily where the darks and where the lights are. Okay, so I'm continuing to add some darks in here with um, by activating the Stability All Pencil. And again, my, my approach to contrast is usually quite striking, quite high. Not everyone employs that approach, you know, and there's so many wonderful styles out there. So you can optionally not do this in more intenser contrast, but it's something I absolutely love. So it begins, brings a drama and sometimes elegance to a piece. And there I'm activating the doodles that were done with the um, Stabilo All Pencil, so also again adds to that uh, contrast. Okay, and I'm back here using a paint marker, this time the Posca pen, to draw line work and details in the shapes of the doodles and the hair. And this is always can be a bit time consuming on my part, so I'll just be like doing all sorts of little doodles. One of my favorite parts of creation, because it has that therapeutic meditative effect. Eyelashes. I'm adding eyelashes. These are always optional. I used to not like eyelashes at all, and nowadays a face doesn't feel finished without eyelashes. These things change over time. I'm adding some details to the little wings. Now we're getting close to finishing the painting, um, although you can work on this forever. It's, it's rare that something is, feels fully finished, and with journaling there's just so much else that you can add. But basically, um, here, here I'm adding the my kind of telltale little hearts and stars on flower stalks. <laughs> And I'll also be adding a quote, I think, in a moment, and just a few more doodles. And then I'm probably going to call it finished soon. So we're speeding it up a little bit here, because this is all line work. And you can see it's just deepening the line work, adding a little bit more paint in just a moment. There we go. But mostly I'm just kind of, this is the finishing touches of line work, doodles, and any kind of little bits of paint that is still needed, that I feel is still needed. Adding a bit of white here with highlights, a little bit of white on the rose as well. And then often near the end of the creation of the page, I will add words or quotes that are encouraging to me or supportive to me or something that I need to hear in that moment. In this case, it's, don't you know yet, it is your light that lights the world which is a beautiful quote by Rumi, amazing poet. And here we have the final spread. Like I said before, I could probably add more to it. And there's a lot of white space, negative space on the left, but um, I love it as it is. So I hope you enjoyed it too, and I can't wait to see your works of art. Thank you again for being here with me today. I truly hope you enjoyed this class. If you did, do consider checking out my other classes on www.willowing.org. I can't wait to hang out with you more. Okay, have a wonderful day and see you again soon. Bye!